Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, let's get started. I'm uh, Wolfgang Losert, Associate Dean for Research in the College of Computer Math and Natural Sciences. And I'm delighted to welcome you to the 21st annual Bioscience Day at the University of Maryland. I really thank you for coming after we've had to have a hiatus of this amazing in-person event for the last uh, three years. The last Bioscience Day was in 2019. And it's great to be back to have uh, the Innovation Corner, student poster presentations, and the career meetups. And I hope you enjoyed all of these events and activities. And you'll enjoy this afternoon's lineup of seminar speakers and then our invited uh, guest lecturer in the evening. So this afternoon, we will have three speakers from the College of Computer, Math, and Natural Sciences. And the speakers will be introduced uh, uh, by students. And uh, we look forward to hearing about the work of all the speakers on viruses. And uh, I'm personally worried about uh, having to wear a mucus-made uh, mask going forward uh, as I see the title of the first talk. So uh, I turn the podium with that to the 2021 Biological Sciences graduate, Maxine Ignacio, uh, who will introduce our first speaker. Maxine. It is a pleasure for me to introduce Dr. Margaret Skull, who joined the university in 2016 as an assistant professor in the Department of Cell Biology and Molecular Genetics. Um, her current research focuses on using in vivo and in vitro model systems to understand how respiratory viruses, um, primarily influenza and rhinoviruses, um, infect the airway epithelium. Previously, uh, previously, she completed her undergraduate studies at Duke University and obtained her PhD in microbiology and immunology at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. As a postdoc, she underwent training with Nobel laureate Dr. Charles Rice and received her Ruth L. Kirstein Research National Service Award. Uh, without further ado, Dr. Dr. Margaret Skull. All right, can you guys hear me okay? All the way in the back? It's good, all right, excellent. All right, well thank you so much. I'm excited to sort of open the session of sort of in-person seminars here for kind of the resurrection of Bioscience um, Day. Uh, so as Maxine mentioned, um, our lab is very interested in respiratory viruses. Um, which has obviously been sort of a hot topic um, in the past few years. And today I'm going to tell you a little bit of the work that my lab does in understanding the mucus barrier to respiratory virus infection. Okay, so we start in the airway, where by the simple act of breathing, we expose our respiratory tract to a variety of potential pathogens, viral, bacterial, and fungal nature, as well as environmental toxins, pollutants, and so forth. So then lining our respiratory tract, all the way from your nose down to your lower lung, um, you have an epithelium. And so that epithelium is a layer of cells that sits at the interface between the external environment and your underlying tissues. And so while this forms a barrier at that interface, it is also unfortunately a target for many of the viral pathogens that we know of today. So this includes uh, parainfluenza virus 1, parainfluenza virus 3, respiratory syncytial virus. These are all viruses that we all likely had as children. Influenza virus, which will be the focus of my talk today. But you can imagine we can add on to this list. SARS-CoV-2, obviously, um, could be included. Seasonal coronaviruses, adenovirus, rhinovirus, so additional causes of the common cold. And what I'm showing you here is just sort of a cross-section of the human airway epithelium. And I hope you can appreciate sort of the infection, oops, right, you got the, there we go, um, infection of specific cells within this epithelium by these different viruses. So the virus that um, you can see here is shown in green, either by using an antibody to identify specific viral proteins in these cells, or by using a recombinant virus that actually expresses a green fluorescent protein so that we can see the infection um, sort of in real time. In addition, we've stained here for um, ciliated cells, which are marked by sort of those red tufts on the surface. 
uh, using an antibody that's specific for a protein called acetylated alpha tubulin. So luckily, our respiratory epithelium is not without defense mechanisms to protect us against initial infection, but also to help us clear an established infection from the lung. And these mechanisms include things like secretion of mucus, as well as clearance of mucus uh, by the coordinated beating of ciliated cells. So these ciliated cells help to propel mucus up and out of our respiratory tract, and this is going on all the time as we're all sitting here in this room. You then swallow that mucus, and um, anything that we act, you know, sort of inhaled gets further neutralized in the stomach. Um, beyond this, we have specialized mechanisms of cell shedding. So you have um, infected cells or otherwise compromised cells that can be removed from this epithelial barrier um, while still preserving sort of that barrier integrity. And then finally, we have the production of cytokines, which are soluble factors that are secreted by cells and can sort of relay messages to other cells um, sort of in the local microenvironment um, that act to uh, stimulate inflammation or recruit certain cell types to the site of infection, as well as certain cytokines called interferons, which are known as sort of antiviral um, cytokines that can help establish what we refer to as an antiviral state um, sort of in cells kind of in the neighborhood. Um, by stimulating expression of hundreds of, of different genes that act to prevent um, or sort of shut down viral replication. <clears throat> so with those things in mind, um, the particular questions that my lab is interested in are how does the mucus barrier protect us against respiratory viral infection? How do underlying epithelial cells respond to a virus that does manage to actually breach that extracellular barrier? And finally, how do specific respiratory virus cell interactions impact the host range or what kinds of species can be infected by a, any sort of given respiratory pathogen. So for my talk today, I'm going to really focus on um, this first question, how does the mucus barrier protect us against uh, respiratory viral infection? And so to give you a little bit more background on the mucus barrier itself, the mucus barrier is actually uh, two layers. Sorry. Um, so you have the secreted mucus gel as well as what we refer to as an underlying periciliary layer. So the secreted mucus gel is what we all think about when we blow our nose into a tissue. Um, that's sort of the mobile gel um, that we think of most often. Um, and then this underlying layer sort of extends the height of one of these cilia that help to propel the secreted mucus layer up and out of the respiratory tract. So importantly, both of these layers are composed of similar kinds of proteins. These proteins are massive, so on the order of 200 megadaltons in size, and they are heavily glycosylated, meaning that they are decorated in a lot of sugars. Um, and so these mucins can be identified in both the secreted mucus layer as well as the underlying periciliary layer. So to sort of zoom in a little bit on the secreted mucus layer, um, the two major secreted mucins um, are referred to as MUC5B and MUC5AC. So these are secreted by specialized cells within the epithelium and are the major sort of protein component of mucus itself. And so because of that, they're responsible for a lot of the sort of viscoelastic properties of mucus if we think of it as sort of a viscoelastic um, uh, gel. So if you look at what one of these mucins sort of looks like in cartoon form, it's sort of this linear um, protein. All these sort of blue lines on here represent glycosylation sites, so you can appreciate sort of how kind of decorated these proteins are in um, sugars. And then on either side, so the N and C termini, um, you have cysteine-rich domains that can then mediate sort of interactions with other mucins to form these long mucin chains that you can see here. So these longer mucin chains then sort of become entangled in one another because of that um, sort of glycosylation that imparts a negative charge to these individual mucins, they then sort of repel each other, and sort of these entanglements and disulfide bond formation then give rise to this mesh that you can see in this picture here, okay? So this um, mesh, as you can appreciate, represents a physical barrier um, and also sort of a trap for anything that we might inhale into the lung and also represents sort of a scaffold for presentation of antibodies or other... Um, cytokines or antimicrobial peptides. So a brief introduction then to the virus that I'm going to focus on today, influenza A virus. So influenza A virus is a negative sense RNA virus. Um, so what that means is its genome is actually 
composed of RNA instead of DNA, like our own cells. And that genome is actually separated across eight different uh, individual RNA molecules or segments. Influenza A targets respiratory epithelial cells for infection. And influenza A viruses uniquely have a very wide host range. So they can infect a very wide range of different kinds of animals and different species. All influenza A viruses are endemic in aquatic birds. And so these viruses circulate um, in, uh, in aquatic birds and then spillover events into the human population can result in a pandemic event. Those viruses then continue to circulate in the human population. And as they then evolve, these are sort of responsible then for the annual epidemics, um, which is one reason why we have to keep getting our flu shot every year. So I just wanted to point out sort of two features of the viral particle um, that will be sort of pop up um, later in my presentation, and that's the hemagglutinin protein on the surface. So the hemagglutinin is the attachment protein for the virus, so it interacts with or binds to sialic acid um, on host cells. The neuraminidase, um, which is this red protein here, is also on the surface of the virus, and it's essentially the functional antagonist of the hemagglutinin. So where the HA binds, the neuraminidase then cleaves those sialic acid residues. So we know that influenza virus is a significant sort of threat to, to public health. Um, so what I'm showing you here is just over the course of the last sort of several um, sort of years. Uh, the CDC tracks sort of the incidence of influenza activity each week. You can monitor this sort of every Friday afternoon um, if you wish. We're about to kind of circle back around here. I think um, this week is actually week 40, so at the end of this week we should have another um, data point sort of plotted on here. But what you can appreciate is that sort of every year um, we have these epidemics in the human population. So this begs the question, how does flu get through mucus? Right, it has to overcome that barrier to reach underlying epithelial cells to actually launch an infection. So previous work in the field has focused primarily on the virus and has honed in on the neuraminidase, sort of that uh, enzyme on the surface of the viral particle that cleaves sialic acid as being a key player in this process. So historically, neuraminidase was thought to really only function at the end of the viral life cycle. So once the virus has infected a cell, it's replicated, it's made new viruses, and now those viruses are leaving that cell. The neuraminidase was shown to help those viruses become free from that cell by sort of cleaving the sialic acid around where that virus was budding. In 2004, sorry, uh, in 2004, a paper by Mikhail um, Matrosevich provided the first evidence that neuraminidase actually played an essential role during initial infection as well. And so the experiment that I'm showing you here um, from his manuscript shows infection of uh, airway epithelial cells with a human influenza virus. And you can see the infected cells are sort of that darker um, sort of black color. However, if they do the infection in the context of a neuraminidase inhibitor, you can see that far fewer cells actually get infected. So this suggested that neuraminidase was playing some sort of role, um, but it wasn't exactly clear what neuraminidase was doing in this process. So then over sort of the course of the next sort of 15 years or so, it's become established in the field that interactions between the hemagglutinin, which again binds to sialic acid, and neuraminidase, which then cleaves sialic acid, drive interactions with mucins in this extracellular space. And so just to sort of highlight um, a little bit of this work, um, it was shown by Vahi and Fletcher um, just very recently in 2009, that both the shape of the viral particle as well as sort of the distribution of the HA and NA on the surface of the virus can help the virus get through the mucus barrier. Um, and then another paper um, uh, from 2017 suggested that neuraminidase, after the virus has made it through the mucus barrier, helps the virus to sort of roll along the surface of the cell to look for places that are more amenable to receptor-mediated endocytosis, which is how this virus actually gets into a cell before it begins to replicate. So we were then interested about the host side. So we, we know that neuraminidase likely plays an important role in helping the virus to essentially chew its way through this mucus barrier, but what about mucus itself? And so to look at this question, we teamed up with uh, Greg Duncan's group, who's here at UMD in the bioengineering department. And so I just wanted to highlight um, Dr. Duncan here, as well as two graduate students in his group, Logan Kaler, uh, 
and uh, Daniel Song, who together with a former graduate student in my group, Ethan Iverson, really spearheaded the work that I'm going to tell you about today. Okay, so our first question was, how can we observe the virus within this secreted mucus gel? And so we took advantage of the fact that influenza uh, has a, a lipid envelope on the surface, similar to our cells, right, sort of coated in lipids. And so we can use a fluorescent dye that actually sort of gets incorporated into those lipids to basically light up the viral particles. And so to show you sort of that this works, we've labeled these viruses with this lip, uh, lipophilic dye called DII, and then stained the virus with an antibody targeting the hemagglutinin protein. And so hopefully you can see um, that we can identify a variety of these different um, sort of viruses that have both the orange uh, lipid label as well as green indicating um, sort of the, the presence of the hemagglutinin. So we have these labeled viral particles. In addition to that, we also use um, polyethylene glycol coated nanoparticles, um, basically as biophysical probes. And so these are also fluorescent, and importantly are also the same size as an influenza virus um, that's either labeled or unlabeled with the DII lipophilic um, dye. And then, um, so these are, are the same size as flu, but a key point here is that these nanoparticles don't stick to mucus. So by adding sort of peg on the surface, they are now what we refer to as being muco-inert, and so they sort of bounce around in mucus without actually sticking to anything. So this allows us to basically decouple um, sort of adhesive interactions or those sort of sticking um, to sort of just steric um, or sort of physical blocking of um, uh, of these particles. So we can then take our labeled flu, we can then take our labeled nanoparticles and put them together in human mucus samples that have been isolated uh, from endotracheal tubes from the University of Mar Maryland Medical Center. And we can image how these things move within the mucus gel itself. We can create um, these sort of traces and then derive what's called a mean squared displacement value for each individual particle in uh, the mucus gel um, to get a sense of how these things, again, are sort of diffusing within this uh, microenvironment. So a low MSD would indicate that the virus sort of hasn't sort of gotten very far away from its sort of reference point, whereas a higher MSD indicates sort of more travel or, or more uh, diffusion. So we took um, sort of this uh, methodology and um, looked at how viruses and nanoparticles move in mucus from um, across 10 different patients. And so what you can see here is that in patient one, the nanoparticles sort of bounced around a little bit more than the, uh, the virus did. In patient five, they look pretty similar. In patient 10, the virus bounces around a little bit more. And so when we looked across all of these different patients, we saw that actually the virus um, sort of moves, or the MSD value that we get for flu, um, is pretty significantly different from individual to individual. But on average, across all of these uh, patient samples, the sort of diffusion characteristics of the virus were very similar to our mucoinert nanoparticles. So this made us think, well, maybe actually the structure or sort of the architecture of the mucus gel itself is playing a key role here and um, sort of prompted us to then interrogate that directly. So here I'm asking, what is the effect of mucin cross-linking, or sort of those interactions between individual mucins, those bonds that they form that I mentioned at the beginning, on how well these viruses can move? And so um, here I'm showing you just nanoparticle and flu movement in a regular mucus um, gel sample. If we reduce or sort of break apart um, those mucin-mucin interactions using a reducing agent called DTT, you can now see that both the virus and the nanoparticle are able to move more freely. And so if we quantify this, you can see using uh, measurements from the nanoparticles, we can understand that after reducing these uh, mucus gels that we do get larger pores as expected. And do we get more rapid diffusion of the virus? Yes, so we also see an increase here in the MSD value that we get for influenza. So what about the reverse, right? So we break apart uh, the mucin uh, sort of hydrogel, we get increased virus mobility. What if we decrease or sort of restrict that pore size by actually increasing disulfide bonds um, between uh, mucins? 
And so to do this, we actually used a synthetic hydrogel system. So this uh, system uh, was really developed uh, in the Duncan lab and enables us to combine mucins with um, crosslinker at varying amounts. And so this gives rise to these sort of mucous hydrogels that you can see here. But we can control the amount of crosslinker that we add into the system. And so what you can see in this graph here is that if we add more crosslinker, um, so 4%, that we have a small pore size, and that um, corresponds to very little influence of virus movement. As we reduce the amount of crosslinker, we have larger pores and more flu mobility, um, suggesting again that the architecture of these mucus gels really plays a significant role in determining how well the virus can actually move or diffuse through mucus. So we did some sort of um, back calculation and knowing uh, sort of an approximate depth of the secreted mucus gel uh, and it's sort of an average individual, um, we went back to sort of the 10 patients that I showed you before and sort of calculated based on these dynamics how many of those people would likely become infected with flu. Um, and we're able to determine that based on the diffusion properties and again sort of assuming a certain depth of the mucus gel, um, three out of the 10, uh, the virus would have actually penetrated through the mucus barrier before that mucus would have gotten cleared out of the lung. Okay, so I told you that there are um, two <laughs> secreted mucins um, that sort of compose this secreted mucus gel barrier, MUC5B and MUC5AC. And while you can see that they are very similar to one another, they do actually differ um, in domain structure. So MUC5AC actually has more cysteine-rich domains, and their glycosylation patterns are also different, um, so that they end up with different charges, which likely impacts their overall conformation or sort of structure. In addition, they occupy distinct regions um, within the respiratory tract. Um, and so just what I want you to kind of take away from these pictures, this is in a normal airway, and this is in a case of fatal asthma where you have um, uh, sort of overproduction of, of some of these mucins, but you'll see that they actually don't sort of intermix with each other, that there are specific um, sort of regions that are rich in either MUC5B or MUC5AC. And so why this is important is that in normal healthy individuals, we are, have uh, secreted mucus that is predominantly MUC5B, so MUC5B rich. However, in asthmatics um, and other chronic lung diseases, we often see sort of a skewing of that ratio. So um, particularly in asthma, we have a greater abundance of MUC5AC as compared to MUC5B. And since we know that respiratory viral infections are a major underlying cause of exacerbation in asthma, we were also interested in understanding how these specific mucins contribute to the mucus barrier. So to answer this question, um, we again sort of turn to the mucus hydrogel system. And here we're using MUC5AC um, from uh, sort of the uh, pink gastric um, tract or MUC5B um, from cows. And we can mix these at different ratios um, and then cross-link again to form these hydrogels. So when we then track influenza in either MUC5AC or MUC5B rich um, sort of synthetic mucus gels, you can see that the virus bounces around or sort of has um, more mobility in MUC5AC rich gels. So again, those are gels that are reflective of uh, sort of chronic lung disease, specifically asthma. So to then take this um, into an infection system and to begin to understand how these differences in mobility translate into differences in infection, we utilize an in vitro model of the human airway epithelium um, in my lab where we start with um, primary cells that are isolated from lungs. Um, so these are frequently deceased donors. Um, specifically, uh, you start with the basal cells uh, from the airway epithelium, which are essentially sort of a resident stem cell um, of this tissue. We can then grow them on plastic for a short period of time before we then seed them onto these sort of trans wells or sort of basket supports. <coughs> um, and then we can remove the media from the apical surface here, which would be representative of sort of the lumen of the lung, um, and just feed these cells from the bottom. So over the course then of approximately two months, these cells, we can re-differentiate them um, to form this pseudostratified epithelium that looks very much like the epithelium in our own respiratory tracts. So here you can see different kinds of cells, so ciliated cells. Um, we have basal cells along the bottom here. 
goblet cells, which are one of the cell types that can produce uh, mucus, and so forth. And so we think that these uh, cultures are particularly good for interrogating the mucus barrier with respect to viral infection um, because they not only have these different kinds of cells, so this is looking at the surface of a ciliated cell, this is a cell that's producing a lot of mucus, this is um, sort of a nondescript um, uh, sort of brush border cell here, um, but these cultures also uh, have um, active ion transport, they secrete mucus, and what I'm showing you in this video here, so this was shot in real time, and this is looking at the coordination of those ciliated cells actually in the dish that transport these mucus secretions then around in a circle. So again, normally in our lung, our ciliated cells coordinate to move mucus up and out of our respiratory tract. In the dish, they don't have anywhere to sort of clear to, um, and so they tend to coordinate with each other in a circle to form what we refer to as a mucus hurricane. Okay, so using this system, we can either remove the mucus um, or um, put MUC5B rich hydrogels and MUC5AC rich hydrogels on the surface and then infect with our virus. And so what you can see in these um, uh, images below, this is looking down at the surface of the culture and in this case, we've stained for the virus, so the virus is shown in green. So without any mucus on the surface, we get a lot of cells that are infected with flu. If we use a MUC5B rich gel, you can see that that acts as a significant barrier to infection. However, the MUC5AC rich gel looks very similar to almost no mucus at all, suggesting that um, these hydrogels that are, are sort of reflective of, of asthma um, are compromised in their barrier function against viruses like influenza. So just to summarize in this uh, first part, um, I've shown you that sort of historically, um, kind of the dogma in the field is that the hemagglutinin binds to mucus and the neuraminidase helps to cleave or sort of release the virus um, to sort of promote or help it uh, get through that mucus barrier. Um, we've also shown that variation exists in this barrier between individuals. Um, which can impact susceptibility to infection, and that's linked to differences in mucus uh, pore size, as well as the ratio of specific mucins within that barrier. Um, so, okay, keep an eye on the clock here. Um, so, I'd now like to go sort of deeper into the mucus barrier and focus a little bit on the underlying periciliary layer, um, where there are also mucin glycoproteins. So the mucin glycoproteins that uh, sort of populate the periciliary layer include uh, tethered mucins 1, 4, and 16. So unlike the mucins that form the secreted mucus gel, those mucins are actually secreted from the cell, these mucins actually remain attached at the surface of airway epithelial cells. And so you can see um, that uh, these uh, mucins here sort of differ in their length. Um, as well as sort of their overall domain structure. They have different cytoplasmic tails, which can sort of interact with other cellular factors um, and, and stimulate uh, sort of sending messages to the cell or triggering different signaling cascades. Um, and they also occupy distinct regions of the PCL. Um, so we know that MUC4 tends to coat the cilia themselves. MUC1 is found um, along the microvilli, so a little bit closer to the surface of the cell. And MUC16 is often found at the surface of goblet cells, or those cells that actually secrete the mucins themselves. And just to give you, again, a, an idea of size, so MUC1, um, which is the one I'll focus on today, is actually sort of the baby of the bunch. And this uh, sort of towers over the surface of the cell at 200 to 500 nanometers, which is really, really big. Um, so you can imagine all the other receptors are sort of hidden down here, um, almost underneath these, these massive mucins. Okay, so MUC1, just a little further introduction. So it is actually the most abundant tethered mucin uh, in, the, uh, in the respiratory tract. And um, if we take a, a little bit closer look at it, its structure, there are basically two subunits that are uh, linked together. The extracellular portion, so this is the part that sticks out into the airway lumen, is also heavily glycosylated. And that can, you can imagine, mediate either attachment um, with certain pathogens or act as a barrier. And then it also has a, a cytoplasmic tail that, as I mentioned, can mediate sort of interactions with a variety of um, cell signaling cascades. Um, and MUC1 has been uh, linked to sort of epithelial growth and migration, um, as well as being uh, sort of a, 
an anti-inflammatory mucin um, that can actually sort of dampen down pro-inflammatory uh, signaling. So, but the take home from this slide, though, the, the point that I really want you to remember is that there's no consensus in the literature as to the function of MUC1 during pathogenic insult. So during bacterial infection or during viral infection, the outcomes, um, or sort of the MUC1 driven outcome seems to be different. So um, again, we decided to use our human airway epithelial culture system to look at the interaction specifically between flu and MUC1. And just to again highlight why I think that um, is a useful system, this is a cross section of uh, airway epithelial cultures as compared to tissue um, sort of directly ex vivo. And you can appreciate sort of the dense um, sort of glycocalyx here. Um, so again, this is looking at individual cilia sort of shafts that are extending from the apical surface of these epithelial cells and sort of that dense um, sort of extracellular environment that's really not sort of found or recapitulated in, in other kinds of cell models that, that are routinely used in the lab. So to begin to understand whether influenza can interact with this mucin, um, a former graduate student in the lab, um, Ethan Iverson, took a cross section of one of our airway epithelial cultures and stained for MUC1. So MUC1 here shown in pink is right at the surface of the epithelial cells. At the same time, he used uh, basically an HA um, protein sort of by itself, um, sort of a recombinant HA probe. Um, and he found that this sort of uh, adhered to the, the cross-section of epithelium, sort of juxtaposed to where we can identify that MUC1 signal. So to give you a first indication that flu could potentially interact with this mucin. So what about the virus? If we put the whole virus together, does that actually interact with MUC1 as well? And so to do this, we sort of um, used a modified ELISA approach. So we have a plate that's coated with antibody that can actually um, sort of trap MUC1 and immobilize it within the well. We can then detect this trapped um, or immobilized MUC1 with a second antibody targeting um, MUC1 that's actually linked um, to biotin. Or we can use an influenza particle that we have biotimulated the surface of. This enables us to detect either the antibody or the virus by adding streptavidin, which will interact with the biotin, um, and HRP to um, sort of result in a color change, um, essentially, in the well. As an additional control, we can incubate the virus with antibodies against the hemagglutinin to actually block its uh, ability to bind um, to MUC1. And so just to, to show you over here, what this data is showing you is that the virus alone can interact with MUC1, but if we incubate the virus with anti-HA antibodies, we lose the ability of the virus to bind to the mucin. So this suggests that basically in a whole viral particle setting, um, that flu can interact with MUC1 in the human airway. So what do we know about how MUC1 interacts with flu? If you look back at the literature, um, this is basically all that was there, this single paper um, from 2017. So they also suggested that influenza and MUC1 could interact um, in immortalized cell lines. But the sort of hypothesis that they came up with at the end is that when these two things interact, that results in MUC1 being cleaved from the surface of the cell or being released, and that that would constitute a way that our um, respiratory tract could then help to clear the virus, right? So the virus would bind the mucin, the mucin would be released, and the virus would be cleared out through normal sort of mucociliary clearance mechanisms, right? Through the, the beating of our ciliated cells and, and clearing things out. So we wanted to determine whether this was also true in our human airway epithelial culture system. So we infected these cells with influenza and then sort of washed the surface and asked how much MUC1 is present in the surface, uh, released onto the surface. And actually we didn't see that MUC1 was being released um, to any significant amounts over uninfected cultures, despite the fact that these cultures were well infected. Um, so I'm just showing you sort of how much virus was actually present in the culture system uh, there. So, that was somewhat surprising to us based on this previous report. And so we then asked how cell-associated MUC1 levels might look during flu infection. And so in addition, um, we know from the literature um, that a wide variety of pro-inflammatory cytokines, um, so again, these sort of uh, secreted molecules from cells that um, act to sort of activate the immune system, that a lot of them have been linked to upregulation of MUC1. Um, and so we also know 
during flu infection that one of the main things that, that gets produced uh, are interferon molecules. So these are essentially antiviral cytokines that can talk to other cells and tell them, sort of alert them to the fact that an infection is going on. Um, and so based on the fact that we know that flu sort of stimulates a lot of sort of pro-inflammatory and antiviral cytokines, we also included condition um, where we treated these cells with uh, interferon, again, one of these main antiviral cytokines that uh, is made during flu infection. And so um, what I'm showing you here is just the amount of MUC1 protein after infection or after interferon stimulation. And so uh, hopefully you can appreciate that compared to untreated conditions, both after treatment with interferons here and here, or after flu infection here and here, that MUC1 levels go up that are uh, associated with the cells. If we add an inhibitor to block these antiviral signals from actually being able to talk to the cells, then we can observe a decrease in that MUC1 expression here and here, but not so much during the viral infection. So basically what that meant to us was that while interferon can contribute to upregulating MUC1 expression in these cells, that uh, other pro-inflammatory cytokines likely contribute as well. So we then asked the question, what cell types in the airway are actually expressing MUC1? And um, to, much to our surprise, um, we saw that just about every cell that we looked at turned up MUC1. So this was really surprising to us because MUC1 is typically just at the apical surface of these cultures of, of our epithelium, right? It's a barrier molecule, so it makes sense for it to act basically as a fence there at the surface of our, of our cells. But yet after either treating these cells with these antiviral molecules or after infection with the virus, you can see that all of these cells uh, are, are expressing MUC1. Furthermore, in, in more recent data, um, we've shown that MUC1, um, specifically a lower molecular weight form of MUC1, can be identified in both the cytoplasm and in the nucleus. So basically, MUC1 is essentially everywhere um, during infection. So what is the impact then of MUC1 on infection? And so to answer this question, we generated human airway epithelial cultures that lack MUC1 expression using CRISPR-Cas9 technology. And so just to briefly walk you through this process, we first design um, sort of guide RNAs to direct um, sort of the Cas9 machinery to the MUC1 gene uh, in the cell uh, chromosome. Um, we then uh, encode that, that guide RNA in a lentivirus that we can use to deliver um, this information to the cells. Um, this is just showing you uh, that we have successfully targeted the MUC1 gene in the genome. And then we can take those cells, differentiate them as I described before, and ensure that um, we have indeed knocked out the MUC1 protein. So you see the absence of uh, a band here, but not sort of related proteins, including MUC4. So we can then use these cultures um, here, which we're able to also determine, differentiate without um, any sort of abnormal uh, effects or sort of gross morphological changes and use them to infect with our virus and ask how MUC1 uh, might change the, the dynamics of, of infection. And so um, what I'm showing you here, after infection of either our control cultures or cultures that lack this important um, mucin within the periciliary layer, um, that we can determine how much virus is being made in these cultures. And so at 12 and 24 hours, in the absence of MUC1, we get more virus, as you can see here and here. This was linked, so if we fix these cultures at certain time points after infection, um, we can also look at the, the frequency of infected cells within the culture. And so focusing primarily at this 12-hour time point, again, in the absence of MUC1, you can see that we get sort of larger um, sort of foci of infection as compared to these sort of individual infection events um, in cultures that actually have uh, normal levels of, of MUC1. So we've done further experiments to also show that MUC1 plays an important role not just during uh, spread of the virus here, but also during initial infection. So if we allow the virus just a very short time frame to actually get into the cells, and then we block their ability to continue to spread um, using an inhibitor of that neuraminidase enzyme that I told you about, um, that we still get uh, significantly more infection events um, in the absence of MUC1.
Okay, so um, I told you that uh, the influenza virus HA binds to sialic acid. Um, we also know that there's a difference between human influenza viruses and avian influenza viruses in exactly the kind of sialic acid that they like to bind to. So human influenza viruses bind to sialic acid in sort of a 2-6 linkage and avian viruses in a 2-3 linkage as shown here. So we just wanted to sort of expand this panel and understand whether MUC1 acted as a barrier against more sort of recent clinical isolates as well as influenza viruses that have differences in their sialic acid binding preference. And so what I'm showing you here is just that. So these are, are different influenza strains or influenza strains that uh, preferentially bind alpha-2,3 or alpha-2,6 linked sialic acid. So again, sort of an avian influenza virus preference or human influenza virus preference. And across the board, in the absence of Mach one you get more infection, suggesting that regardless of receptor or sialic acid binding preference, you get uh, Mach one sort of contributes to blocking flu infection in our respiratory tract. Okay, so um, I'm just gonna sort of present uh, the model and I think sort of the last five minutes here. Um, so uh, we think that MUC1 sort of significantly impacts the ability of flu to actually infect an epithelial cell. So we think that it blocks viral uptake. However, some virus likely gets through that barrier and that virus can begin to replicate and spread. This will trigger a host response, um, which involves pro-inflammatory cytokines as well as antiviral uh, molecules like interferon that get produced. These uh, sort of signaling uh, or sort of cytokines can then trigger increased expression of MUC1, sort of basically throughout uh, the epithelium, uh, and that this can sort of further help to block spread of the virus. Um, and may also contribute to tissue repair and sort of controlling inflammation, right? We need inflammation to, to sort of um, clear the infection, but too much inflammation can also be a bad thing. So we think that MUC1 likely helps to block spread and also to sort of quiet the immune system down um, later on during the infection. So um, and just sort of the, the last bit here, I just also want to highlight that uh, we've also done experiments to show that infection of the airway epithelium can also trigger MUC1 expression on other cell types that we know can be found in the respiratory tract. So here we've done an experiment where we infect airway epithelial cells. The airway epithelial cells will secrete these cytokines, and so then we can take those cytokines and feed them to another cell, in this case a cell called macrophage. Um, and what we've shown here is that by doing that, we get an increase in MUC1 in these macrophages. Similarly, in vivo, um, we've shown that infecting mice can also trigger or upregulate MUC1 expression on a variety of different cell types, including dendritic cells um, that I'm just showing you here. So um, this work is ongoing, um, but we think it adds sort of an additional arm onto this model where upregulation of MUC1, not just at the level of the epithelium, but also on other cell types may impact their immune function and uh, help to dictate the course of influenza virus uh, and disease. Okay. Um, so just, uh, I don't know if there's a clock. In the... I'll be your clock. Okay, you can be my clock. Excellent, thank it's you. 249. Okay, all right, so just uh, almost there. Um, so beyond MUC1, there are other tethered mucins. Um, you might remember uh, from sort of the background slide, we have MUC4 and MUC16. Um, and so we've also begun work to kind of expand um, our, our question to look at these other tethered mucins and their role during viral infection as well. So um, we've uh, gathered data that shows that these antiviral cytokines um, can upregulate expression of these other um, tethered mucins, uh, though the expression is not quite as broad as we observed for MUC1. And in cultures that lack MUC4, again, this is looking at influenza infection, that we also see an increase in sort of the replication kinetics of flu in the absence of MUC4 as well. Um, and then finally, um, a couple recent papers that have come out um, looking at SARS-CoV-2 have shown uh, through different screening strategies uh, that both MUC1 and MUC4 um, likely act as barriers against SARS-CoV-2, uh, potentially in a similar sort of mechanism that we've seen for flu. However, um, 
uh, for rhinovirus, we actually see that deletion of MUC1 or MUC4 don't seem to have a major impact. So it, it looks like the rules, the same set of rules may not apply for all viruses. There are important differences in sort of the size and kinds of interactions that viruses like SARS and flu versus rhinovirus um, sort of engage in during infection. Um, and so we're really interested in kind of teasing out uh, sort of these different kinds of interactions for different viruses. Okay, so the take home message um, is basically that we have this two layer system, uh, secreted mucus gel and an underlying periciliary layer. These layers are dynamic um, and both host and viral factors are gonna dictate whether or not the virus gets through. Um, and so with that, just a, sort of by way of a, sort of further introduction, um, beyond uh, sort of mucins, my lab is also interested in other uh, sort of innate uh, interactions. Um, and so if any of these things are, are of interest to you, I'm happy to talk to you sort of after the lecture or can track me down um, using my email and, and I'd be happy to discuss further aspects of uh, sort of the antiviral response, um, as well as several projects looking more specifically at um, sort of SARS interactions uh, with the airway epithelium, which is also the target for, um, for that virus. Okay, and so with that, um, I'd like to really acknowledge um, Ethan Iverson, um, who was a former graduate student in the lab, who, who really, again, sort of spearheaded most of the work that I showed you today. Um, the, the newer uh, data that I showed you um, related to these projects has been uh, from Leila Abdelhamid, a postdoc in the lab, and Maria Reif, a graduate student, uh, Maxine Ignacio, um, who sort of, makes, I think, works on every project maybe that we have in the lab. Um, and provides excellent sort of technical support. Um, and Kira Griswold, who is a former undergraduate turned technician, um, who's now a, a graduate student um, at Pitt, um, as well as uh, the Duncan Lab, uh, Greg Duncan, Daniel Song, and Logan Kaler, um, who again played uh, an essential role and have been uh, sort of excellent collaborative uh, partners in a lot of the secretive mucin work. Um, and with that, I'll just acknowledge uh, all our funding and be happy to take any questions. Thank you all for your attention. Margaret, uh, first of all, we have a little uh, recognition gift for kicking off Bioscience Day. Um, as Wolfgang said in his introduction, um, we had uh, viruses and barriers to participation in person in the last two years. I just want to make an announcement because it seems like we'll have a barrier to participation that will muck up Bioscience Day 21. There's apparently a water main break that is uh, affecting this building. So our current plan is to carry on in here until five o'clock, but we have to move the keynote to 0224 in the Edward St. John building, one of the large classrooms. So if we suddenly get an alarm, it's because of a water main break and we'll have to leave before then, but our plan is to carry on in here. So with that, uh, we'll have Margaret take some questions. I'm not responsible for the mucking up. Of <laughs> and there's a microphone in the middle if uh, people want to walk to that so we can hear your question. Very nice talk from Joshua White's on the five o'clock speaker. Nice listening to this. Uh, very talk on mucins. I have a few questions. One of which was simply, is there any anti-mucin downregulation by viruses? I had a random question about your hurricanes, if they ever turn around the other way. <laughs> uh, and then my third one, so I'll, I'll let you maybe speculate, is that it, at least in my world of phage, when I work on phage, there's sometimes an advantage of adhering to because then they can be present when bacteria show up. Is there a selective advantage to it here? And you're talking about the negative side. So I was wondering if you could maybe speculate on all three. I'm happy to re repeat them. There's yeah, the so maybe I'll go in sort of reverse order. So, um, you know, interestingly, so initially, um, it was sort of, you know, 50-50, and, and I almost sort of put my money that flu is actually using MUC1 to anchor itself closer to the epithelium. It was also sort of fueled by other um, papers in the literature that show that a lot of, or at least some of the molecules that MUC1 can interact with in the cell are also important for uptake of flu into the cell. So to me, it seemed logical that you could have a virus that attached to MUC1 
Um, you have neuraminidase, which can um, uh, potentially strip MUC1 of some of its glycans, which is also a trigger for uptake of MUC1 back into the cell. Because these mucins are so big, you can imagine that the cell doesn't want to have to make a new one every time the one on the surface you know, gets compromised in some way, so it does recycle um, back into the cell. So that seems like a perfect way for a virus to sort of hitch a ride to get in. Um, but then the, I guess sort of the data led us kind of in the opposite direction. So, um, but there is, I think, a lot of room, you know, there are, are bacterial pathogens for which studies have been performed that show um, that adhesion to these mucins certainly uh, prolongs their retention in the airway. Um, and then you can see for flu, it's sort of the opposite story. So uh, yeah, I think we just ha sort of have to go through empirically and, and really look at how these interactions are happening. Um, Hurricanes, do they ever them. turn around the other way just because there's yeah. some interesting collective behavior there? Or do they start small and then get big? Or do they just spontaneously get these large scale order effects? Um, sorry, you mean in terms of the recycling? Well, or? Uh, when you have beating collectively that seems to go with one chirality, you use one way around the infection. Oh, uh, sorry, the, the, um, the hurricane. Yeah, the hurricane. Yeah, right. Exactly. So, um, yeah, I, I do actually get that question a lot, um, and yet no one has offered to fund me to like do this experiment in Australia. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, I mean, they, I do think that they typically go counterclockwise. Um, how these cells sort of get trained to do that normally is is by fluid flow, um, and so during as these cells are differentiating, the number of ciliated cells will increase, and and you need sort of a threshold of ciliated cells so that they can sort of talk you know, to one another, essentially. Part of that's mediated through calcium um, and so forth. And, and, and then, you know, eventually they sort of coordinate with each other in a circle. Um, on occasion, you get essentially eddies um, sort of spinning, yeah, yeah, um, off of there. But um, yeah, I mean, we can even sort of measure sort of the speed and, and so forth of how um, well that mucus is being transported. But yeah, and you can train the cells to go in different directions using fluid flow. but. Uh, oh, and since there's not anyone behind me, I'm sure someone else will ask a question. Yeah. Can you mind speculating on any anti muc one properties of virus? Yeah, so that's a fascinating question. I mean, we know that viruses have just hundreds of ways to basically shut off antiviral responses and, and so forth. Um, to date, I'm not aware of any defined mechanism by which um, a virus specifically sort of antagonizes um, that, you know, mucin expression uh, or function. Um, but a lot of what MUC1 might be doing in the cell, um, so these signaling pathways that I referred to, um, the virus may actually target sort of downstream. Um, so, you know, other sort of pro-inflammatory pathways, um, you know, toll-like receptor signaling, NLR signaling, and so forth, that we know the virus does antagonize sort of at least more directly. Time for one more question, and then we'll have our transition to the next talk. A question, Charles Snyderman. Uh, that question stimulated me to um, ask you a couple of questions about your, um, your, your pathogenic model here. Um, is that circulation of mucus uh, uh, representative of, of um, Normal function in, in uh, either humans or other mammals, where where supposedly the cilia all sweep up, you know, toward the outside, mm -hmm. and yes. and um, does that? Um, is, is there a good correlation between what you're seeing in your model and um, d data from? For example, influenza infection in, in uh, human tissue. Yeah, so um, I guess a major difference there is that, again, we don't, in the dish, the virus doesn't clear to anywhere. So it's essentially kind of a terminal experiment in that sense. Um, that in the dish, the virus will um, get spread by the mucus and, and the ciliated cells sort of transporting that mucus. Uh, in fact, you can see that spread pattern. It almost looks like a comet, if you can imagine, of, of sort of infected cells. Um, uh, that, that, so you can sort of track uh, 
the direction that the virus is sort of spreading in. Um, and again, in our dish, that kind of translates to spread, whereas in an actual lung, hopefully that translates to sort of clearance or at least protection of the lower lung. Basically, everything that, that sort of happens in the respiratory tract is to protect your ability to breathe. Um, and so you want you know, to protect that, you know, your, your alveolar region of your lung with everything that you have. Um, and so clearing that virus up and out um, is, is part of that sort of mechanism. So it might be that, that the virus, you know, if it um, sort of impacts lower in the lung, that hopefully it's just then kind of spreading up instead of down um, into the deeper into your respiratory tract. Um, in terms of like the, the rate of mucus clearance and, and so forth, those dynamics are very similar to, to what we have in, in the respiratory tract. So um, yeah, a lot of those sort of physical dynamics uh, are, are similar. Okay, I'll make an exception for my first TA who kept me in the job for 30 years. Betsy, go ahead. Okay, thank you. Uh, Betsy Reed Canole from the NCI, NIH. Um, lovely, lovely talk. I really enjoyed it. Have you looked at any um, or the results of the lung microbiome or perhaps the virome to see what interactions might be occurring? Yeah, so another good question. Um, so, you know, I guess until at least, you know, relatively recently, you know, the lung was always thought of as being somewhat sterile, right? And so obviously I think that that um, viewpoint has evolved. Um, certainly the respiratory tract does not have the microbiome sort of load as the gut um, does, but there are certainly bacteria um, that occupy that niche. Um, we have not, I guess, tried, um, at least on purpose, to add bacteria into our cultures. <laughs> um, there are, there are groups, I think, that are, are looking at that, um, and, and then the specific I believe there's that. some looking at lung cancer, for instance. Yeah, and, and trying to figure out a way to, to sort of add that in, in sort of a, a, a way that kind of recapitulates what's happening in the lung. Um, so there are people, certainly, that are, are going in that direction, I think. Um, you could imagine that those... Um, sort of microbiome there could potentially modify, you know, glycans and things on, on mucins and, and so forth in a way that then might impact a viral infection. But we really haven't done any of that work. But great question. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, thank you again, Margaret.